Hi everyone, this is Mani Deepak from Momentum Lab. Today we have a guest, Pratik Karmakar, co-founder of Screen PMS. Hi Pratik, thanks for joining Hi. on a holy day. <laughs> Today I want to delve into a very relevant topic for all of us uh, as to how quant and factor fund managers navigate the downturns. Uh, being a practitioner yourself, I think your insights would hugely help our viewers. Um, before we get into this topic, uh, I wanted to give a quick intro. Uh, Pratik is a graduate from NIT. He completed his MBA from FMS Delhi. He took a variety of roles. Uh, he had a startup uh, before PMS, uh, before this PMS. Um, I think it would be better to hear it from the man himself uh, about the journey that uh, uh, took him here. Um, maybe Pratik, if you can also talk about the quant fund that you manage and how is your approach unique compared to traditional discretionary investing? Okay. Uh, so first of all, uh, thanks Mani Deepak for having me here and inviting me and uh, uh, recording this uh, uh, with me. Um, so if I talk about, uh, uh, so like you have mentioned that I did my engineering from NIT and then I did my MBA. So I had interest in markets uh, from, uh, from from college times itself. Uh, so generally how it starts uh, with anyone who is interested in markets is he, uh, uh, first of all, the inten intention is always to make money first without learning uh, uh, what stock markets really is. So that, that was the same story with me. So I traded uh, initially um, on uh, stock market tapes and news channels. It didn't work out as, as, as you would know. It never does. And then obviously when I delve deep into it, I uh, started getting hooked more and more into stock markets, right? Uh, so I started with uh, uh, learning about value investing and growth investing and the whole uh, how, how people invest fundamentally. Um, then uh, I slowly moved uh, a bit into systematic investing through some sort of a trend following or uh, a momentum-based investing methodology. But mind you, this was still discretionary. I was still uh, doing this in a discretionary way. Uh, eventually, what bear market taught me is uh, uh, so whenever things are going wrong um, all around you, what you need is uh, you need to take decisions uh, without getting the emotions uh, getting the better of you. Uh, so that uh, uh, kind of got me interested into uh, complete uh, uh, level of systematic investing. So like you mentioned, so what, uh, uh, what people should do during bear market if you are a con or a systematic investor. I think it's much better, uh, and this is my opinion, it's much better to be a complete, uh, completely systematic investor uh, because bear markets are actually uh, very unnerving for a discretionary investor because you don't know what, I mean, I mean it is, what kind of decisions may go wrong and, and under, under a large amount of risk, you are much more likely to make the wrong decisions. So that's how you move uh, uh, more into the systematic investing kind of a framework. Nice. If you can talk about the quant, quant fund that you manage, yeah. You're up to. So we started. Uh, we have we have been doing systematic investing on our own books, uh, uh, the prop and personal books. Uh, so it it was working well. And uh, based on our research, we started this. Uh, we started deploying this in client accounts in our PMS fund uh, last year from May uh, 2024 itself. Uh, mind you, we started the PMS uh, a year back. Uh, so we were running only one uh, fund till then, which is more of a fundamental trend following a mix of, of a discretionary investing over there. So we started this quant fund last year. Uh, so it hasn't been long, uh, but till now the results are promising. Uh, it hasn't seen a full-fledged bull market yet, uh, but we have saved most of the uh, most of the investor's money in the fall. So for instance, we would be minus 1.9% uh, uh, in Feb and uh, would be around 7% in the last three months. So overall, would be around plus three, uh, plus four, or more or less flat in the, uh, since our inception. Nice. nice. So during a market downturn, how mm -hmm. does a quant or factor-based strategy adapt? Uh, do you Have you observed that there are certain factors that perform better in bear mat markets? And if so, which ones? So uh, first of all, let's uh, understand what people can do during bear markets. Uh, uh, one level above uh, uh, moving factors. So what can people do? They can sell, right? They can exit stocks. They can move to debt. 
Uh, another way is to always have an asset allocation that I will put certain percentage in gold, certain percentage in bonds, certain in uh, FDs and debt, and certain in equities. That is one asset allocation way. One is the uh, switching methodology that uh, based on certain uh, rules or based on my discretion, I would switch between asset classes. Right. Another way is, is to think that uh, uh, I would hedge my portfolio by looking at uncorrelated assets. My uncorrelated assets, it means that I would hedge it using, uh, I mean, I'm giving you examples, like I will hedge it using gold, or I can hedge using a mix of, uh, a, a mix of a naked put, a naked long put, or any other put strategy, basically some sort of hedging. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so these things can be done uh, on a permanent basis. Then comes in uh, what you mentioned, what kind of factors such as people can do. Uh, so if you talk about uh, uh, major four factors, uh, uh, low volatility, quality, in term and value. Uh, again, so what I have observed and based on the data we have for the past 20, 25 years in India, uh, no two beer markets are alike. Right? It's not that uh, value would outperform in uh, all the beer markets or momentum would do well in all the beer markets. Uh, but one uh, uh, one factor that I have noticed by, I mean, uh, it's common knowledge then, uh, uh, just by his name, that low volatility has the lowest amount of volatility. Uh, uh, that, that particular factor. In, so in beer markets, it falls the least. But then the flip side is it, it makes uh, uh, the least amount of returns in uh, good times also. It's not that uh, you set a rule that uh, uh, value would perform better during falls or momentum would perform better during falls, but that has not consistently been true. Right. Uh, the only consistent uh, trend that I have seen is that low volatility falls the least uh, during bear markets. Uh, this has been true across all uh, major bear markets in India. So on a CAGR basis, uh, it might give you a good sharp ratio, uh, but it earns a, a earns much significantly lesser than say momentum or value. Uh, if I talk about uh, quality, quality is the second best performance across uh, all bear markets uh, because obviously, if you have a good balance sheet, if you have been have had a good ROC and you are a good business, you are better placed than your competitors to uh, survive the downturn or whatever the issue might be in the economy or a uh, general macro environment. Uh, comparing momentum and value, uh, uh, what I have seen is, uh, again, so it, there's no consistent trend across the bear markets as to, uh, value would outperform uh, your bear markets because obviously they have less, value, they have low value. You have a very big margin of safety, but that sometimes does not work in all bear markets. Like for instance, in 2008 or, uh, or in the 2013 or, or 2015 bear markets, value has performed worse than even momentum. Uh, interestingly, the, the bear market that we are seeing right now, which is the ongoing bear market, uh, in fact, momentum has fallen more than value. So it just goes to prove that uh, there is no consistent pattern over here. Uh, again, so whenever the recovery comes, uh, there is again no pattern. Sometimes value outperforms momentum, sometimes uh, momentum outperforms value. Uh, I think it has got more to do uh, uh, on the reasons of the bear market or the recovery uh because let's let's say they, they, if i take the example of the 2018 uh, bear market it was one of the ma- major reasons was the uh, 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 b- banking nbas right if you if you recall that time so i would assume during that time uh, uh, uh and, and if you and if you also recall there were a lot of uh, management quality and fraudulent uh, companies that were coming out in the uh, in the market so people had a, uh, the trust in in promoters was at a low time all time low so i mean it's my assumption is at that time uh, people would be seeing that these companies have value if, it, if they just go by the balance sheet uh, but eventually that they ended up being value traps so so again just tells you sometimes uh, that uh, that's one, that's one of the reasons why value would not outperform in certain uh, bear market scenarios uh, another thing what people can do uh, during bear markets if they are a, they are a systematic trader is reduce the beta of the portfolio. Uh, if I, if they look at beta uh, as a, or 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 the or its proxy the market cap, they might want to move from micro caps and small caps to large caps uh, during those times. And another extreme is uh, 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 change the beta or reduce the beta down to zero itself uh, by moving to cash or FDs or bonds or cash equivalents. So so what. Uh, realistically, uh, people, because again, uh, uh, I just want to underscore the fact that uh, all of these factors are also correlated with the market. If the market goes down, all of them have to eventually go down right. over a certain time period. And if the market recovers, all of them will give you uh, a positive return. Uh, 
let's say you have a value portfolio or a momentum portfolio or any other factor portfolio so the only way uh, uh, you can actually uh, reduce your losses i mean you can reduce your losses by factor switching also but you can uh, if you want to completely stop the losses then you have to move to another asset class interesting so i think that brings me to this question of what risk management techniques do you employ to control drawdowns broadly and okay. how do you balance reducing the downside risk uh, while ensuring that you participate when the market rebounds right so how do you manage that timing and that switch yeah so my thought over here is uh, speed is of uh, speed is essential here so if you want to uh, uh, reduce your exposure or if you move to asset classes other asset classes then you have to come back also uh, soon enough right. or you will miss out on the recovery uh so uh, a few things that we do is uh, we do active beta switching of our portfolio uh, so if you have if we have a certain amount of small caps and small caps we think are going into a bear market based on our systems then and if conversely if large caps are uh, giving a counter indication then probably will uh, move over there or, or vice versa uh if nothing is working if all indicators are showing that uh, it, it is a downturn in reality then we have to move to other asset classes or move to a us etf or chinese etf or gold silver or maybe straight to cash equivalents so if you look at distribution of returns uh, of the market mm. and if you plot them a common knowledge tells you that it will be a normal distribution let's say on y axis if it is frequency mm. and if the return daily or whatever time period return is on the x axis mm. uh, but actually market returns uh, are distributed uh, uh, when you, when you distribute market return it has a very uh, fat left tail right okay. so which essentially means that there are more uh, instances of large negative returns than instances of large positive returns okay. right so uh, what you actually need to do is cut out the left part right right so that that is your worst case scenario uh, you just need to reduce the uh, the large negative returns of from your portfolio uh, even if you uh, uh, even if you uh, give away some amount of opportunity loss let's say small opportunity losses of the market to the to the market by uh, uh, remaining out of the market i think that's still acceptable because uh, uh, the math takes care of itself you know how how uh, multiplicative geometry works yeah. so uh, the, so like i mentioned so if we uh, have to get out and get in with certain amount of speed there would be instances where we uh, give out certain amount of returns to the market but what it also tells you at uh, uh, again so, uh, so like there would be false positives uh, whenever you exit and the market rebounds immediately uh, but it also what it, the consequences it cuts away cuts out the large negative losses also right mm -hmm. so so overall you do very well uh, if you if you of uh, trying this methodology and uh, work in the markets got it got it so i i understand your your quant fund started just last year um yeah. but i i believe you would have done a lot of back testing etc yeah. uh you know uh, number crunching before you got into this right so what are your lessons from the past bear markets like looking at previous corrections or crashes mm -hmm. what key takeaways have shaped your investment philosophy mm -hmm. and how has data driven investing evolved to handle volatility mm -hmm. right so like i uh, briefly mentioned in the beginning uh, so, uh, so so during uh, uh, during numerous bear markets in the past uh, when i was doing discretionary investing and was not completely into systematic investing uh, so what actually uh, kills your return is the your emotional biases uh, right uh so that uh, uh i found difficult to handle during bear market because if eventually when you are under stress every day uh, you may bound to make bad mistakes mm. uh so if uh, when you when you talk about back testing so if uh, uh if i look if i apply the same rules that we have been using today uh, now it's a given that i would have been or our fund would have been better off uh, back then if i was doing quantitative investing back then uh but obviously there is obviously a, a look at bias over here because not all uh, faults are alike mm. uh, uh the biggest takeaway i think would be that uh, uh, under no circumstances uh, does uh, can one accept big losses mm. uh, in, in be it any kind of investing so 
if you can eliminate the big losses like uh, like everyone says like the rule number 1 is to uh, not lose money and rule number 2 is to, uh, to not forget rule number 1 so so that is essentially true across all uh, strategies or all forms of investing so so that is one big takeaway uh, that i have from uh, uh, testing our strategy across past bear markets is uh, is, is a systematic investing would have performed better back then got it got it and are you seeing any similarities between the current downturn that we are experiencing versus the previous mm-hmm. corrections or is it very unique in itself so uh, there are some similarities with the uh, 2018 correction over up to uh, if you compare it to to today's correction but uh, the, the some similar similarities being slow down of growth which is a, a central similarity between these two bear markets but but it's uh, it is similar in certain ways that we have not seen any uh, big banking npas uh, coming in uh basically the system, the the economy is not at at such a bad shape as it was back then mm. uh so uh, but again so uh, it's still not over so uh, uh, we are uh, we have to uh, go through the conclusion to again <laughs> find out similarities in hindsight uh another thing is uh, another thing is that there was a little bit of fi outflow back then also mm. uh but uh, obviously the numbers are, are not uh, too similar or not comparable to today's mm-hmm. so yeah so again so these things are always mostly analyzed in hindsight uh so i mean we have to just look at how things work from over here all right so uh, i think to conclude for those interested in learning more about systematic and factoring mm-hmm. what are some books research papers or other resources that you would recommend that you would have gone through yourself okay there are uh, so so firstly uh, the, this field of investing is uh, kind of multidisciplinary so you need to uh, have knowledge across multiple disciplines uh, so when someone makes a, a, a systematic investing portfolio or or a strategy uh, so so what kills a systematic investing strategy is is human biases and emotions when uh, the person tries to override the system so i think that is uh, the first thing that people have to read about is uh, uh, behavioral fallacies uh, behavioral economics and uh, some sort of uh, some sort of spiritual education uh, is is essential over here basically uh, what people used to say like dissociate with the from from the results focus and rely on the process more so that is the first thing that uh, people have to do and then obviously uh, uh, basic knowledge of factors is is needed over here like if you want to learn more about trend following more about momentum so that i think they can learn from uh, there is a very famous book uh, by william o'neil uh, uh, how to make money in stock market that the title is a bit uh, cheesy and cliche but it's a re- uh, really good book uh, uh, apart from that uh, uh, there are a bunch of books on systematic investing uh, as well so one of i think one of the well known authors is robert carver he has written two or three or maybe more books on systematic investing so these books uh, will probably teach uh, how to think systematically they would not essentially uh, give you a strategy that you can deploy from tomorrow but they will teach teach you uh, or the investor in a systematic way how to think on those on those lines uh, other than that uh, uh, there are the original uh, factor investing research papers by farm and french are uh, available on their website there is quite a lot actually so i have not gone through most of them uh they and uh, if if someone wants to test their strategies they need to know uh, uh, some sort of a statistical uh, package or a computer language like python or r so so python in finance or some sort of book has to be read i mean even youtube is a brilliant resource and uh, and mostly everything is out there in the form of books or podcasts or videos uh, just need to keep uh, one's ears and eyes open got it all right uh, it was very nice talking to you pratik uh, it was a great session thank you very much